I'm heading to catch up with one of triathlon's most successful female athletes, Denmark's Hella Fredriksson, to find out more about her career and how she became the world record holder over the Ironman 70.3 distance. Now, Hella became a triathlete back in 2004 and then turned professional four years later racing over the ITU distance. And she says the highlight of that part of her career was getting to represent Denmark at the London 2012 Olympics. Following her debut appearance at the Olympic Games, she made the move to non-drafting triathlon and took up the challenge of racing over the 70.3 distance. And it was just two years after that that she actually got that world record, which still stands now. Well, Hella has actually concluded that illustrious career and recently announced her retirement. And she's very kindly agreed to have a chat to me. So let's go find her. So Hella, I want to kind of jump in uh, 2012 at the Olympics. I'm noticing your tattoo on your leg, so I know it obviously yeah. meant a big, uh, uh, you know, a big moment in your career. What did that do to your career in triathlon, and, and how did you then move on from that? Well, so Olympic has always been a childhood dream. I come as a, has a swim background. I was a national swimmer and wanted to make the Olympics in Sydney, but I lost motivation, you know, teenager, all that stuff and never made it to Sydney. So when I then got into triathlon, that was my dream. Um, we tried hard for, for Beijing. And I only really started to get into the qualification system in, in seven, 2007, so I was very late into qualification and didn't make it. Uh, so therefore, London became the big, big, big target. Uh, and getting over there, uh, yeah, it was a dream come true and, and very patriotic feeling. Definitely. And how did London actually go for you? Oh, well, I didn't have the result that I came if after. That's, that's the thing about ITU racing. Sometimes it can be a little bit um, hit and miss. And I missed uh, three seconds out of the water, which meant I sat in the second group. And um, Team Tactic made it that the second group could not work well together. And uh, I think we were two minutes down when we got into uh, T2, and then it's basically came over. I mean, I had the seventh fastest run time on a 10K, but when you're sitting sitting yeah. in second group, it's too short doesn't matter, to make doesn't up. matter. So I was 27th, so yeah. it was definitely not the result, but I mean, but it was the, an Olympic yeah. experience. It was uh, absolutely still yeah. great, great. And was some of that frustration a uh, trigger to move to long distance? Was that your last ITU race? Yeah, it was, I did one more in, in 2013, a sprint race uh, in Claremont, actually, uh, Florida. Uh, but yeah, absolutely was triggered by that. I wanted to be more controller of the race where I felt like, I often felt that I trained way better than I performed. And I felt again, as I said, there was some lock and where do you sit? And, and if you miss something out of the swim, like some seconds out of the swim, that's, yeah, detrimental on, on your race, it can be. So I wanted to kind of, yeah, be in charts. And I jumped in in deep end in 2013 with, uh, half Ironman in Puerto Rico, uh, which I won over, I remember, um, uh, Miranda Carfrey and Leander Cave and Kelly Williamson and how a superstar stuck. Like, so I did not know what I was doing at all. I just knew how to race an Olympic distance and as, as hard as you can mm -hmm. until the wheels falls off. And I survived and won the race. Um, it was kind of like a milestone in my career because I, I went to the US, um, I left the Federation, uh, Danish Federation, left the national team, no support behind me, and then just went over and took but, a chance. But, but free to sort of exactly, do yeah. what you want. You don't have that financial support, but you've got, I guess, more of a uh, open window Absolutely. and a blank yeah. sheet to, to go and make it or, or break it. It's, it's Absolutely, and, and I needed that motivation. I needed that new kick. I needed something to see what I could actually do. And that's the beauty of triathlon, that we have so many distances and so many formats. So I feel like you can kind of, you know, almost get like a semi-new career just by changing distance, right? And, and I really found my place when I went to non-draft. And did, was, was part of the decision of going to the States due to the, to the money? And I know in 2014, you were the, I think the highest earner in triathlon in the female field. Did, did like, the States play a part in that? Was that going hand in hand? Um, I think I was not really thinking about the, the money <laughs> side of it. I was more thinking about how do I get better as an athlete. And it was definitely not in Denmark. And also the weather doesn't really allow it mm -hmm. to, to become as good as I wanted to be. And I really just needed a challenge, something new and something to, yeah, just looking of how can I make myself better. And 
And when I then started to do non-draft racing, I was not even aware of that actually the price purse was quite good and it's better than it is today. Um, and uh, I was good at it, straight on, straight from the get-go. And yeah, I was, I was starting to make a, a really good living and, and it was, I mean, like taking that chance. And at that point, um, we also took the chance of Ben came with me, my husband, and uh, and uh, we kind of just raced from race to race and a flight ticket and we were staying at home stay and suddenly we were starting to make money and Ben was not working and we were just doing this together. So it was, a, yeah, it was kind of a fun experience. Tell me about the year that you got the the world record time that still stands now five years later, that 3.55.50. Yeah. Talk me through that race and, and how did you get to that point? Uh, that was absolutely crazy. So. Uh, um, I did um, Ironman 70.3 Worlds in Mont Tremblant in 14. I didn't finish the race and I was so disappointed and I was so mad at myself. So I just wanted to make this Challenge Bahrain my world championship and have a redemption. And like the feel was crazy because, you know, at that point they were starting to get traveling to the Middle East. We were invited down by Sheik Nesas, which is also doing the Bahrain Endurance 13 now. So that was when it all started down there and uh, we were treated like, uh, well. Like royalty. <laughs> exactly. And it was just that experience in itself. So after Mont Tremblant, I actually went to Lanzarote to, to put my head down for more or less three months. Um, I got my coach to come to me, uh, Joel Filio wow. paid him to come down and I was really putting all my eggs so in that thing. I invested yeah. a lot in that thing. Uh, ben was in the US, I was just there digging hard, working hard and going down to, uh, to Challenge Bahrain. Uh, I knew I was very fit uh, and I knew I was ready but I felt like I overperformed. Like I performed better than I could have imagined. Like it was just a day where everything came together. Um, the swim was super, super hard, but I was there where I should be in the front of the, very, very close to the front of the race, in the bike, in the front group, and uh, on the run, I just took charts in the beginning and ran a 117 flat on that half marathon, and that was really flying. I can still, when I see the coverage now, I was flying, and it looked brilliant, <laughs> I think. Um, so yeah, I'm very, very proud of that race, and uh, I mean, like, also, the price purse was huge for, like even for like $100,000, it's a lot of money to win in triathlon. Yeah. Um, to sort of flip things over a little bit, you've, you know, you were, you still are the fastest in the world, but you didn't ever get that world title at 70.3. How close did you ever get and, and how do you feel about that? Chattanooga was the only race I actually did. Uh, so, and I was fifth there. Uh, probably a day where, if I look back, I should be on the podium with some tactical errors on the bike. That is what it is. It's my own fault. I should have raced better. I learned from that. Um, so no, I've never done it. I was thinking about it today, actually walking around here in Nice, that I've never really done a world championship really on the distance that I would say that's the distance I was best at. Um, so it, it is odd how sometimes your, your career shapes uh, and after 14, I got injured in 15, then I was out 15, 16, and came back and raced, um, yeah, Mont Tremblant, uh, Chattanooga in 17, 18, I focused on, uh, on Kona instead because it was South Africa. So, I mean, how things just play out to, you know, if you do it or you don't do it. And, you know, you started to go longer and, and then it looked uh, from the outside that, you know, that was then going to be the next few years. And, and it sort of was everything and then suddenly we're now and you know <laughs> yeah. that is the end. T yeah. Talk me through that, that decision to go longer and, and through the ITU yeah. long distance and, and then on to your decision to go to a full Ironman. Yeah, I mean like Ironman wasn't in the card. Uh, it was just a funny decision or idea that we talked about uh, in the beginning of 17. Maybe we should try and I was like, Pfft. I'm not doing an Ironman. I definitely need to do a, a long distance before I'm doing an Ironman. I might not even get through it. Like, and I might not even like it. Uh, such a long day. I was really just like, no. Then I did uh, Penticton uh, ITU Long Distance Worlds in Canada in 17. And I think that went well, but I mean like a, ha a long distance is closer to a half distance. Yeah. An Ironman is really, another it's, it's another level. It's something completely different pacing wise. 
nutrition strategy and all that stuff um, where you can get away with that in the other distance a little bit more. Um, so then we said, okay, let's try and do an, an Ironman in the end of 17. That's not going to interfere with, with, um, with anything. And we did the Arizona there. And I think I had a, had a decent debut again. I learned my lesson, didn't train as I should do up to that race. I was training myself, so I was just thinking, you just need to do distance, mileage, intensity, everything. <laughs> and I was together in whatever order you feel like. <laughs> oh yeah, and I was cooked. I was so cooked in Arizona, so, but I got through it. Um, and it qualified, I actually qualified for Kona uh, because I've had a lot of good 70 point trees as well. Mm -hmm. So then we were like, don't do another Ironman because I was still wanted to do half distance in 18 and then I only really did, did Kona there uh, last year. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I came very late into the Ironman racing and um, so therefore we were planning to do another one this year uh, and that was actually the way to, to finish my career, a little fairy tale, racing in Copenhagen, racing amazingly well, but unfortunately I got uh, injured a, a month out and I was kind of looking in and saying, okay, what does it do to your career to do another race? When are you going to be satisfied? Is a win enough? What is it that's enough for you? And I was like, a win? Well, a win to some, some random Ironman wasn't what I was going for. I was going for Copenhagen at home soil with 200,000 spectators going out there with a bang, right? Um, and then also Kona, of course. But, but, and then I could just feel like, no, doing some late Ironman this year was just like, you know, you're just going to push it and when am I going to be satisfied and will it make my career any difference? And I came to the conclusion, it won't. It won't. I've achieved everything I want to achieve. I'm satisfied. I'm content. And I was kind of like, okay, but then it's okay. It's okay to say stop now then. As long as I can still, you know, uh, have good results in my sleeve, still be a contender in any race that I race in, uh, be a podium contender, uh, that was when I wanted to stop instead of feeling that I'm going downhill again and okay you need to get you need to stop now this is this is getting embarrassing for yourself kind of. okay not in that way but you know what I mean like and I, and I wanted to I wanted to stop before that um, not that I felt that it was coming but you never know when it is coming um, and I am getting older and I just also want to be strong and healthy and for anything else that I'm gonna uh, throw my energy at. Um, so that was why we made the decision. It was tough. I don't, I won't, it was very tough. I've been crying a lot. This has been my, my life. You know, I've been getting up every morning. I've been living for this life and I've been, I've been good at it and I, I've really, really worked hard. And so it, it wasn't easy at all. And I was also going like, sure, no, maybe, yeah. So it was really also, you know, being very practical and pros and cons, what is it that you want? Why is it that you believe this is the right time? And all these things. So, I mean, it's been tough, but it's, it's, it's the right thing to do. And talking about, you know, dominating, you know, you dominated the world and you put absolutely everything into it. You now have this huge amount of energy that was there to put somewhere else. Yeah. Where are you going to put it? <laughs> so I... It was my plan not to have a plan because I would like to uh, actually take time to just take it all in, relax, recover, um, maybe actually have a little bit of a holiday that I haven't had for kind of 15 years or so. And then uh, I have uh, still have work with some of my sponsors. They're still uh, putting their trust in me and seeing the valuable, uh, it being valuable for them to, to, to have me as an ambassador, which I'm, I'm grateful for. Um, and then I'm next week starting to write an autobiography. Um, so, uh, and then we're gonna launch that in spring. So it's gonna be kind of full on for that uh, book to get ready first in Danish and then in English. And I think, I'm sure the book would be great, but I also think it's going to be a good process yeah, to sure. get through. Uh, and I think there's gonna come some, something up that I actually can't remember that you know, you mm. can't just plant it somewhere because you wanna forget it, yeah. but it comes up again, right? And then that's gonna make good storytelling and I think an inspiring book because uh, yeah I mean athletes uh, they don't just come dropping down from the sky it, it's hard work through a lot a lot a lot of years and 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 telling that story 
from the get-go, I think that would be fun. Yeah, I know, like, you know, we've only just scratched on the surface, so I'd love to, to hear more and, and to look at that. But before we finish, just the sort of final reflection, obviously 2014 was that incredible year. 2018, you became ITU Long Course World Champion. What was the highlight of your career? What that, like, one day, was it even a day in training when you reached something you'd never done before? But is there that one day that you can look back on those 15 years that was just a day that changed or that was really significant for whether it's an obvious one or not? Yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, I, there's a few answers for this one. Um, I think what I'm most proud of is my consistency from when I started to race, uh, non-draft racing, that I've basically more or less been on the podium in all my races since uh, the autumn of 2012, except four races. Um, that, that I'm actually very, very proud of, being this consistent. I'm not racing every single weekend like some people are. I'm racing when I'm ready to race. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I will say um, Challenge Bahrain and getting to the Olympics and then becoming ITU Long Distance World Champion. Those are the three and then my consistency. So it was not one, it was not one You could answer. be a politician as well. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, well, an amazing career and thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Thank today, you Helen. for letting me, thank Cheers. you.